Hey everyone, so happy to have you with us on Hour of History, a fine show that brings you our world at any time of the day, in any place in the world. And we appreciate all the listeners that are tuning in from all over the globe, still waiting to get that seventh continent. So if you know anyone on Antarctica on some sort of scientific exploration, please tell them to download Hour of History. We're on Google Play, iTunes, YouTube, but you know all that because you found us. So let's get to business. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Hour of History. There you will find over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Our guest on this episode is Professor Lillian Guetta, who is a professor at the University of Florida, where she holds the Waldo W. Naykirk Term Professorship for Excellence in Teaching, as well as the University of Florida's Research Foundation Professorship for Superb Scholarship. Now, coming into this interview, I thought we were going to focus primarily on Cuba because I've just read her fourth book that came out in 2018 by Yale University Press called Heroes, Martyrs, and Political Messiahs in Revolutionary Cuba, 1946 to 1958, which is a fantastic book that sort of pushes the time frame of the Cuban Revolution. But the conversation ended up going in a bit of a different direction, which is no less fascinating, perhaps more fascinating if you are interested more generally in how historians work and how historians share their work and how historians come to their work. So if you're interested in history, Cuba, or just how to be a good historian, you're really going to enjoy this conversation and this episode of Hour of History. Thanks for joining. And remember, check out www.hourofhistory.com forward slash Rex for recommendations for all the books that were mentioned in this episode. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy. This is the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. And now from the Hour of History studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, your Hour of History starts right now. Welcome to Hour of History. I'm here with Dr. Lillian Guerra, um, and we're going to talk about Cuba. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. So I think if uh, ever we're going to have, like we've done a lot of Cuba episodes on our history before, but um, it's hard to top you as a Cuba expert. You've written how many books on Cuba? I have written three, and I'm writing another one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what? why do you study Cuba? Hmm. Um, I think it became inescapable from the time I was a child, um, precisely because I didn't grow up in a place where one could take for granted being Cuban, and that was Marion, Kansas, a very small town. Um, How many, like, it's are we talking? 2,200 people, 2,200 people. Okay. Very small. Um, we were literally the only non-white folks in the town, with the exception of um, an African-American boy <clears throat> named Warren. Hi, Warren. Uh, <laughs> who um, came and Friend went. Friend of the show. Yeah, he was often he was he was often not there, you know, in my growing up period. But kindergarten through seventh grade, um, I lived there, and then we moved to Miami, and to the heart of Hialeah. But. Before you went to Miami in Kansas, what was like your experience? Your experience being Cuban, was there like a Jose Marti bust in your? <laughs> no. no, but you know, we our main language in the household was Spanish. Oh, okay. um, my first language was Spanish. Uh, we were also because we were non like pioneer children. Um, our families weren't pioneer. Our, my family was not a pioneer family. Um, we were not really seen as Americans. We were seen as, my, both my sister and I, even though we had been born in New York, um, we were seen as Cuban. And that was rather liberating. I mean, we, nobody ever tried to Americanize us. Oh. Um, my parents weren't, weren't trying to Americanize us. 
And um, that meant that, um, in fact, a lot of my friends um, there became increasingly Cubanized by the, our, you know, our presence, mm -hmm. and because I think our food was so much better. Than <laughs> <laughs> so you, that's really cool. So you introduced a bunch of people to something that was very far away, very different. Yeah, and intentionally. Um, my father was the doctor of the town, oh. and he had been recruited to go there. He's from Pina de Rio. He died um, three years ago, but, um, oh. so he was from Pina de Rio, and his mother had been a rural school teacher for 43 years in a similarly very small place in Pina de Rio. Um, he had been the only one of his brothers who um, went beyond eighth grade and had always had the dream of being a rural doctor, I think. Really? Um, yeah, and so his, um, his the town closest to his farm um, in, in Cuba um, had a very prestigious doctor as mayor. Pedro ah. Diaz. Um, so my dad always told the story when he wanted to become a doctor, and it was when he broke his um, his his arm uh -huh. or his leg. Now I can't remember. I think it's his arm. <laughs> That's some limb. And um, yeah, and uh, and Pedro Diaz came and set his his arm, and um, and he you can tell that he rem he admired that man very well. He had a library. Um, so my dad's um, kind of desire to serve the rural masses um, ended um, after the revolution when um, it turned to communism as a means for uplifting the masses. And lo and behold, you know, um, years and years later, um, in 1973, um, he had this offer from Kansas and he moved us out there regardless of what my mother might have thought about. <laughs> yeah, and he chased his rural, that, that's like, a, and having a doctor leading the town, I feel like reading a, a lot of Cuban history, it seems like doctors are always up there in political spots, whereas you don't see that so much in the United States. Yeah, the tradition in Cuba um, at the end of the 19th century of um, people who could have chosen to be loyal to Spain, but because of their wealth, because of their position, um, but chose, in fact, to turn their backs on Spain and all that that might have offered, um, that tradition was important to the 30 years of, of struggle against the Spanish and the independence um, wars. And so that's the root, in many respects, of this kind of mission to um, to do something beyond the self, right? Doctors and teachers um, long before 1959 um, were probably the most prestigious people in Cuba. Um, teachers um, in particular who were willing to serve in rural schools. And so, um, you know, as of the mid 1920s, when we got, you know, something of, of the first dictator of Cuba, one of the best parts of his government was the Ministry of Education. And what they allowed was for people who established um, a school mm -hmm. um, uh, to get that school recognized once they had managed to, to, to basically, you know, keep the school up for four years. I think it was four years. Um, and once your school was recognized, then you got federal funding or national funding for the school. And that's how my grandmother um, started off. She had a small inheritance. She was a mulata. Her mm -hmm. father was a white Spaniard. She got a, uh, when he left the country to go back to Spain, she had four um, sisters. Um, each one got an inheritance, and two of them went to the normal school, which is the teacher training school. Mm -hmm. And she then built a little building and um, set up a school. And her salary was paid in kind by the local peasants until wow. Gerardo Machado and his minister of education, Ramiro Guerra, no relation that we know of, <laughs> yeah. great historian of Cuba, uh, recognized her school. Wow. So those, so, those, so we, yeah. you have generations of teachers and doctors. Um, that's a shout out to my parents. My dad's a doctor, my mom's a teacher mm -hmm. in rural areas. Um, that's very interesting and very cool. And we'll talk more about that, um, this sort of how, you know, people have a perception of Cuba sort of rebeginning in uh, 1959. And a lot of your work sort of proves that that's not the case. And a lot of these things were going on uh, much longer than the revolution. So hopefully we can get back to that. But how did you end up in Miami? Uh, oh, that's easy. And there was a, a major farming crisis that nobody, for, nobody remembers um, that was the result of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan Whoa. in 1980. And um, in we had... And it was felt in and Kansas. It, it felt in Kansas because um, Kansas farmers had um, huge contracts with the Soviet Union to supply uh, them with from wheat. From like the Khrushchev 
No, they no. were they were result of a sort of detente of, of the 1970s. Um, and so, you know, suddenly they had nobody to sell their wheat to, and my father spent quite a bit of time not receiving any compensation. Ah. Uh, because back then, people didn't have insurance. They paid out of pocket. And, I mean, at one point, I, I tell this story quite a bit, um, at one point we had something like um, six freezers in um, our house and at the office because by my father's patients would pay him in whole sides um, of beef. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, wow. and in fact, we, I mean, one of the things we ate three times a week for more than probably nine months or to a year was filet mignon. <laughs> and my mother swore me to secrecy and my sister to not say that we were eating filet mignon. I thought it was the most normal thing in the world. <laughs> and it was because it was the most expensive part wow. of the cow. Yeah. So my dad's patients were trying to pay him for serious, you know, cardiological um, diagnoses wow. and yeah. treatment and all of this in this form. And so then eventually it just, the town just right. disappeared. Well, from my father's perspective, we had to move. So he, he, yeah. he, we took off for Miami. That's how we ended up in Miami. And so how, did, were you uh, diving back into the Cuban community or was well, it? Well, like I hated um, Miami. I mean, I still have great difficulty with Miami because those who were of my parents' generation who were exiles were just very, very um, simplistic in their assessments of why they had left Cuba. Uh -huh. And I was pretty horrified because my father, who at one point would take, you know, up to an hour to explain why he left Cuba, had suddenly reduced it to, you know, one sentence, which was this sort of party line, we could say, of the exile elite of Miami. And that was, you know, well, it was a paradise before 1959, and Fidel Castro, right. you know, made it all into a horror and a hell, and so we had to leave. And this, this is another reason why I became a historian, because <clears throat> it seemed to have happened in the span of three weeks. Yeah. Um, and I remember it, you know, it was 1984. I remember when we were at this... Um, you know, it was a gathering at my uncle's house, and somebody asked him this, and he, you know, instead of going into the agrarian reform, you know, <laughs> you know, he suddenly, like out of nowhere, pulled in this, pulled, pulled this, like one line narrative out, and I thought, this is what, you know, wow. and effectively, the the um, the replacing of memory with amnesia on my father's part, hmm. especially in the context of 1980s Reaganism and all that that meant for. Um, U.S. Um, support for military dictatorships in Latin America. You know, I was I became extremely aware of that in Miami, um, and I was lucky enough to go to a school uh, where that kind of analysis and thinking was encouraged. Um, and it was a largely, um, you know, white school. It was Ransom Everglades and Coconut Grove. There were, you know, two black kids. Three, three black kids I can name out of mm -hmm. 400 and something students um, there, and there were there were seven. Latinos. Yeah. Everybody else is white. And are you still in the household totally speaking Spanish? It's or I had your parents started. You know, that's a long story. Um, I, I frankly, I became. I, I realized when I got to Miami, and this is a benefit of going there, that I was illiterate in Spanish. That I oh. could speak it, so I thought. And, but I couldn't read it and I couldn't write it. Hmm. And this, also my father's, you know, sort of, you know, um, jettisoning of his own history brought me to the conclusion that I needed to write to my hundreds of relatives in Cuba, uh -huh. including his two brothers, my first cousins, my mother's family. So what had been a chore, which was writing my family, became kind of a mission. And I started writing um, Maria de Carmen Guerra, who is my for my first cousin. Mm -hmm. um, she's um, from Las Olvas. She's about five years older than I am. And so I started writing <clears throat> my relatives. And to do that, I had to take Spanish classes. And so mm -hmm. Ransom offered a class that was Spanish for Spanish speakers. Cool. Um, and it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, it took a long time, frankly, to become utterly fluent. I mean, I did that, and then I went to Dartmouth, and there I did a major in Spanish, not because I wanted to do anything with it. I mm -hmm. wanted to be utterly fluent in Spanish. So, you know, I So was that's a when you started major taking like the major. literature courses and things like that. Right, and I took a lot of literature in high school, you know, AP Spanish literature and whatever, because I did have a very high degree of fluency. And once I learned the grammar, then Daniels. I was like, oh my God, you know, nobody oh, because, needed to yeah, teach yes, me how yes, to yes, read, okay. you know, I was like, oh. Um, and what, uh, Dartmouth, I've, I've been to Dartmouth a number of times, Hanover, um, and that's way out there. What did your parents think about that? You know, one of the great things <laughs> about my parents is that they had never in their lives um, imagined that they should impede our ambition. 
And that had a lot to do with my mother's own upbringing as the only girl in her family and how much her, her parents had encouraged her to pursue, um, you know, an academic dream. That got shut down with Batista's um, terror against the students in the 1950s, and the University of Havana was closed in 1956 by vote of the student body and the faculty. So that ended her career, and she entered the University of Havana when she was 15 years old. Wow. Um, she would have been the first person to have got, first woman to have gotten a PhD in physics and mathematics. Mm. And instead, she became a secretary. Mm hmm. Um, and my father, you know, who also found himself utterly, um, you know, cut off by the same decision, when eventually he did become a doctor, it was with my mother's support, and it was in a different country and all that kind of stuff. So both of them, when we were growing up, um, never, never, never imagined that we would do anything but go to the best place we could possibly go to. Right. For me, that was to go as far away from Miami <laughs> as I could get. You um, did it. Pretty yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> and what was uh, was the dirt cowboy still there? Or? Oh, it certainly is. And when I'm when I've you know I've, I still am very good friends with my um, my sisters from my childhood in Kansas, Christine and Carol Lau, and um, and it's funny when I talk to Christine in particular, who's one year younger than I am, mm -hmm. I realize that we speak identically. At least I begin oh, to really? speak yeah. as she speaks yeah, yeah. with a very heavy Kansan accent. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, and Carol studied Spanish in, in college. And so, I mean, this is, you know, the Kansanness is, is very much a part of who I am. I think um, it also made it easy to go to Cuba yeah. for the first time and, and visit all my rural relatives um, mm -hmm. because there is something about um, life in rural areas and the complexity of peasant um, cultures based on honor and based on, um, you know, face-to-face -face interactions and you're you're always going to be accountable you know you never yeah. get away from that accountability so I had a lot to deal with when I ended up going there um, because my father had been gone like literally gone my mother kept in touch and kept ourselves in touch with our family in Cuba but my father was out of it and they weren't worried at all of when you started studying more Cuban history and getting really into Spanish were they like a little apprehensive that you might end up going back to Cuba or? well actually yes you bring me back to the real reason that I studied <laughs> all this because I my father's amnesia I needed to go to uh. Cuba so from the time I was 14 I mean I was like you know I don't know close to um, I don't know a devil worshiper in my father's <laughs> mind right right yeah. <laughs> Whenever this would That's come the up. Sense I'm getting um, and you know ultimately by the time I, I started the PhD, um, you know, there, I was an adult. There was no turning back. It was very difficult for them when I went to, um, and this is the reason, I mean, you know, we talk about why I have a distrust of Miami or I don't like it, I didn't like it. I mean, I, I couldn't stand the amnesia, the privilege of, of, of certain people who could decide that they don't really need to know and they don't care mm -hmm. about what Cuba was um, after they left or what it became. And when I went to Cuba for the first time, the, um, this was to do my PhD research. The Cuban government and the Clinton administration came together on the idea that I could go down there for a year, uh -huh. but I couldn't go out and come back. I would be, it was not a multi-entry visa, it was a one-year stay, and so I'd have to be there that entire time. And from my, um, my and advisor's perspective, that was just fine. You know, I mean, most people who studied at UW-Madison and did Latin America, and none of them were Cubanists, and they would go to Peru and they'd be there for a year, and what was the big deal? Um, from my parents' perspective, that was a it was horrifying. Yeah. Um, turned out to be very difficult, very different than going anywhere else. It was like going to a different planet. Um, <laughs> but um, when I went there, my father, who was a doctor in Miami in Hialeah at that point, he could not tell any of his patients that he was um, right. that where I was. I mean, nobody could say anything where I was because you know um, he would have um, suffered the consequences, which is the loss of a lot of his patients. You know, this was. I mean, if you went to Cuba today, of course, it's not that that way because so many thousands of people like myself have returned, as we call it, returning. Yeah. We haven't ever visited, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. In defiance of of their parents or their grandparents, but um, at the time going there. Um, you know, would have resulted in potential death threats to yeah. my father. Um, it's you know, the it, accusation that, that his daughter was an agent of Castro. Right. Um, I mean, it, we didn't get beyond that until I got a job, until I had published my first book um, on Cuba. Yeah, and so that really that by two thousand and five things had changed. Two thousand four. I, I think that um, people 
just in general, and you see it with students a lot of times, just seeking out an easy answer or a one-line answer, like that's maybe it's just a human thing, you know, we're just going for the easy explanation. I've noticed that happening a lot um, just in my own interactions, but you add on top of it the, the sort of like necessity or for self-protection and self-preservation and throw it into this historical amnesia category, it just gets even more uh, armed and more ramped up, this just like one-line history. Mm -hmm. And even... Um, I would imagine you you said things have changed and things absolutely have changed, but I imagine a lot of uh, in a lot of ways they haven't with the sort of like simplistic one line thinking and uh, um, that's that's really interesting thing to think about. It's, it, it, the, this is why I do Hour of History, and this is why I'm a historian too, is to add complexity. Does history do this? Are we doing a good job in changing people from just having a one line one answer to these sort of things? Or do you think we could improve on that? Mm -hmm. You know, I, in my own experience, I find that um, students are, and, and people in general, um, will have positions that are, you know, historically, um, we can say, accurate, um, and yet they don't have a historical explanation for why they have those positions. And so in my own classes, um, I try to explain you know, um, what is racism? Mm -hmm. uh, by explaining it literally, um, the People class I'm about to teach. Quiet. <laughs> right, you know, asking that question, I understand that it's very difficult for students to, you know, come up with an explanation. They can uh, they can understand what what it means and how it how it exhibits itself and how it gets manifested. But most people don't have an understanding of what its origins are. And so, you know, I'm about to teach a class a very um, very much is was called the Black Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we study um, as the origin of racism is the belief, you know, back in Spain, um, in Europe, um, in, among Catholics, that was is relatively recent belief um, prior to Columbus, about 150 years before Columbus, that there was a kind of fixity to one's um, Jewishness, that even if you became a Christian, you converted to Catholicism, that no longer, you know, was uh, were you in fact a Christian in the same way as somebody who was an old Christian. Um, and that the fact that the institutional church adopted this as doctrine and that it became part of policy long before Columbus arrived in America, then makes it makes it possible for, for people to understand that once Columbus does arrive and the conquest happens, that the way in which he and others, conquistadors, are seeing native peoples is through the lens of a subhuman um, category of folks. They can become Christians, but they'll never be as good a Christians, real Christians, as we are. And this comes from you know, their own experience um, as old Christians interacting, in, yeah. you know, with, with new Christians and Jews in Spain who refuse to convert. So these kinds of ideas of race, once, you know, they, the word race and racism um, are terms that, that um, have evolved in time, but they also have origins. And even when we didn't have a way of speaking about those words, you know, um, certainly nobody in Columbus's time used the word racist right. to describe any of this, right? Even those who were highly critical. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't use it. It just means that we should also learn um, that there's something beyond that. Like, what does that mean that well, Columbus was a racist? Yeah. You know, um, it's really interesting too the way you periodize that going back further, like. I think uh, a lot of times people just are so eager to start the discussion now with what's happened or, you know, if a current event happened, let's talk about it going back maybe 50 years or, mm -hmm. you know, no one's going to go back to the Spanish Empire. Right. So um, that's good. I'm glad I'm glad you're doing that. I'm, I try to do the same thing with my class. And a lot of times it gets eye rolls and kind of like sighs like... Do we really have to go back to Columbus or mm. even before Columbus? So that I think that's an important thing um, to bring back. So Cuba and the Caribbean are a great place to study that kind of thing, right? Um, you, you just sort of happened, I mean, you didn't choose to be Cuban. It's a nice coincidence, right? I'm not Cuban, but I found my way to the Caribbean one way or another. And it's easier uh, in a lot of ways to study these sort of things because of the diversity in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, how has that played into what you've written about the uh, interaction between different ethnicities, different racial groups mm -hmm. in the Caribbean? 
Well, certainly, I mean, there is, there's a certain burden to um, deciding that you're going to um, study Cuba, especially if you're Cuban. Um, yeah. I think that inscribed, as I've now analyzed ad nauseum, I think, in my various books, you know, um, Cubans have a, a kind of moral righteousness, um, regardless of the positions that they might have taken over time. They have a moral righteousness about those positions, this kind of patriot versus traitor understanding of our history. Um, comes from the fact that, you know, in 1898, when the U.S. invaded Cuba and occupied Cuba, it began a process of constant occupation or threatening occupation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a kind of, we had a sense that our destiny, our true destiny had been taken away from us. And so that, you know, built on it, snowballed into the various ways in which Cubans still, um, and then after 59, um, you know, had to respond to um, this kind of paradigm. You're either with us or you're against us, you know, and who is the us? Mm -hmm. You know, is it the island um, Cubans, um, the denial, or is it the Miami Cubans, the denial of sort of, of, um, of, of, of difference and and um, plurality of views, you know, the denial of debate even, that has taken us over at various times. And this is why I think a lot of young people, my generation, who, especially those who grew up in Miami and went to faraway places like Dartmouth or what have you, mm -hmm. um, we, had, we had a lot of problems with um, how people perceived us. Um, Puerto Ricans, for instance, uh, at Dartmouth, um, Mexicans um, at Dartmouth as a, you know, as yeah. a college, they, you know, they hated me um, <laughs> before they even heard, you know, anything out of my mouth, right? Yeah. And so I had to um, constantly deal with stereotypes about who I was that were right wing, that were assumed a lot that, you know, I mean, something simple like, you know, Reagan had championed the ending of affirmative action. Right. Um, his spokespeople for that were, of course, his um, model minority of Cuban Americans who had founded the Cuban American National Foundation. Right. Um, so th they were a minority of Latinos. They were a minority among minorities who somehow believed that there these historically accumulated disadvantages that we had um, as non-whites um, should not be corrected. And so there I was dealing with all of that. And, it, and one way to understand um, you know, how I could deal with that was to, and how I could respond to it as somebody who didn't want to um, just accept my stereotype or become part of it or, you know, or just ignore these critiques that people had of, of Cubans. Um, one way of dealing that was to learn about Puerto Rico, for instance. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was no place, I mean, you know, in the United States that was offering a class on the history of Puerto Rico. I mean, Juan Flores was um, in New York. Um, there were classes on literature, um, Princeton, you know, the great um, sort of Puerto Rican intellectuals, um, with the exception of one, who was Franco Scarano um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. You know, none of these people were offering classes on the history of Puerto Rico. And so I got a fellowship to go to Puerto Rico. I spent a year there. This is in undergrad. This is in, okay. as I, after I graduated between graduate school. Okay, and, yeah. So it was 1993, 1992 uh -huh. to 1993. And there, you know, I can't tell you how intense the, um, the rejection was um, by Puerto Ricans. Wow. Because for them, I had a Cuban accent. Uh, and in Puerto Rico, to this day, most Cubans are pro-statehood. Right. Um, the University of Puerto Rico is a hotbed of, always been a hotbed of pro-independence um, activism. And I was, of course, always in favor of the independence of Puerto Rico. Yeah. <laughs> Associated it right. with my own view of Martí and uh, Cuba yeah. and whatever. So this, it was hard. It was hard, but I never kind of gave up, like, the idea that I was going to be a comparative Caribbeanist. Yeah. And, um, and you know, as I've rolled old, grown, you know, it's been a long time, right? Um, you know, 25 years, um, 26 years since I graduated. In that time, a lot of comparative histories have emerged. And um, many, many, many people have taken up the burden of talking to one another um, about our differences, about our misperceptions, um, about the, the erroneous fiction that somehow um, Jamaicans and Haitians don't have anything in common. Yeah. Or Jamaicans and Cubans don't have anything in common. Well, I, yeah, and I have um, experienced that too. I taught in New York City for a bit, and I taught in a high school that was almost entirely Jamaican with a small Haitian population. And um, 
the way the the sort of battles that would go on between the two groups were incredible and it was really frustrating too at the same time i was teaching the new york state global curriculum you know i had to teach it and they they had no idea about their history and i couldn't teach they were interested mm -hmm. we'd talk about it you know but i couldn't officially teach it mm -hmm. um so I imagine, like, when you say this sort of thing, that there's nothing being offered on Puerto Rico, um, I imagine you're at Dartmouth taking, like, a Western civilization class or something, you know, <laughs> and there's no, like, but maybe Dartmouth was a little different at that point, but maybe not. No, it wasn't that bad. I mean, certainly, in fact, at Dartmouth, there was, uh, I mean, I was basically a third world history major. There was virtually every class, every, it was a, there was a class on everything. There was a class. That's cool that Douglas Haynes taught on Vietnam, on Southeast Asia. I took classes on Indonesia, on the Philippines, on India. I took tons of classes on Africa, um, Latin America. I mean, that was all there. Okay. But Puerto Rico always gets left out because it is, is part of, supposedly yeah. part of the United States. And this is one of the legacies of colonialism that we still live. I mean, if you do a PhD in the history of Puerto Rico, um, you are struggling constantly to be considered a Latin Americanist. Um, by many people, um, and by scholars, by institutions. Um, you know, Puerto Rico, I was told by somebody that I would have studied with um, otherwise um, for my PhD was not a part of Latin America. So why would I possibly, why would I go, why would I take a year off? You know, if go. I could go and study with her immediately a PhD in, in Cuban history, why would I go to Puerto Rico for a year? Um, and that was startling, and yet it's still the case. I mean, Puerto Rico is more likely to be taught in an American studies course, and that as a field is a new field. It's, a, it's an offshoot of American history, of U.S. history, but one that um, in many respects um, started off as a field where, you know, you were looking for U.S. history in other places, right, a sort of imperial history of the United States, and it has deepened dramatically and folded back on itself so that, American studies now includes, you know, many studies of, of the United States, you know, the internal processes and dynamics it, of the United States. It just, it, it always seems so backwards uh, to me, the scope of, um, I know more and more American historians are saying, are looking globally, but just, um, just these nation-based fields. I mean, even talking to people in Cuba, it's impossible to talk to someone who doesn't have connections in Canada, United States, Puerto Rico, you know? Mm -hmm. So the connections that go beyond these geographic areas that we tend to limit ourselves to seems to be a big limitation in history. Mm -hmm. um, how do we do that with, how do we sort of bring that in without destroying these geographical studies. So how can you, you can be a Latin American historian, but still, how, how do you avoid the fact that Chinese are being brought in, you know, to Latin America? At what point, you know, how do, how do we have anything concrete with such a blurry world? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it's blurry, but it's not that blurry. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I don't leave that out. And I think, um, you know, the Chinese indentured servants, for instance, that were brought to Cuba and more than 100,000 were brought, um, they were brought in, um, you know, and, and were a very prominent part of the landscape um, as either descendants or as the indentured servants themselves. And there's new Chinese immigrations in the 20th century. There's a lot of ways to engage that mm -hmm. uh, without leaving behind, you know, the mandate that you, you should do the national history of Cuba and mm -hmm. you should um, spend a heck of a lot of time working on, you know, the experience of black Cubans and the relationship between um, nation state formation and U.S. imperial, um, in interventionism. You know, I mean, all that has to be there. It's, it's amount, it's a matter of, um, one's commitment to, um, figuring out how to do this. You know, how do you create a grand narrative, um, that is your own, mm -hmm. um, whether it's in the context of a book or it's in the classroom. And I frankly think that, um, you know, I'm utterly opposed to these kinds of core curriculum standards. I think that they restrain the ability of teachers um, so, to, in fact, um, be creative, to teach beyond, teach beyond the test, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I was a product, too, of, of, of teachers as a young person, again, in Kansas, where um, the, those teachers, because they had had a particular experience in their lives, would bring that into the classroom. So, I mean, I, I recently wrote um, for the AHA, the American Historical Association's magazine, Perspectives, mm -hmm. um, a, a, a kind of an op-ed piece here, 
where I name Mrs. Case, who is my fifth grade mm. teacher, and she, um, you know, her husband had been stationed in Japan, and she spent a whole week on Japanese culture and Japanese history. Yeah. Um, that led us also into the terrain of studying World War II and studying Nazism yeah. and studying things like the Cold War. And, and for that, I mean, I'm eternally grateful because we were... You know, this is back in 1979, and at that time, we were still doing all kinds of nuclear drills. I mean, yeah. you know, it was a big deal. We would all gather in the gymnasium, um, you know, and, and ridiculously have to put our heads between our knees and cover our, our, our heads and sit up against the walls right. if that's going to protect us from a nuclear bomb, you know? Um, yeah. So th there was a, a relationship of the present to the past that she brought in because she was, a, you know, an organic intellectual who knew stuff. Yeah, um, <laughs> I know. I think and that's so cool. And the freedom to do giving that. Giving teachers the freedom to do that is the important thing because I, I almost, I, well, most of the teachers I've worked with certainly have stories and experiences that they draw on. Everyone has experiences that they can draw on. And uh, yeah, I think that's a huge help. Um, is that something that you find yourself able to do at the university level? Are you able to create or are you sort of bogged down to fitting these requirements? No, I've always been. I mean, I've taught at three different institutions. I've never had anybody tell me that I couldn't teach um, a class the way I wanted to teach it. Um, one of the things you have to do, of course, is, is um, show that the class is either um, worthy of being taught because what you're offering is something that no one else is offering at the university. And so even if it has low enrollment, it's worth mm -hmm. it. Um, or you, you can, you can show that you can get those numbers up. I'll give you an example. Um, and you can, you can bring in people to that. Uh, you know, you built it and they, they will come and they, they are coming. So when I um, taught at my second position at Yale, they have their um, shopping period, mm -hmm. which is a nightmare if you're an assistant professor because that means that nobody is registered for your class the whole first week that you're teaching the class. They just get they to just feel it They just register as they, they move from one class to the next. And so I was forewarned by my still dear friends, um, um, Gil Joseph and Stuart Schwartz, that what I needed to do was recognize that, like, first, if I don't get these kids registered, I don't get a TA. And, um, and you, the numbers determine who you get, who you get, whether you get a TA right. or not. So, um, <laughs> and the lady who ran that was this, uh, she's no longer there, but she was, uh, she was, I would say, I would describe her as a racist woman. Mm -hmm. Um, she didn't believe you know, at all, that somebody would have any interest in taking a class on the history of Cuban Puerto Rico, which is one of my bread and butter classes, um, would not take a class on the Black Caribbean. So she was always convinced, and you had to go in with your uh, uh, your sign-up sheet, your attendance sheet, mm -hmm. the first three days you're giving class to show you had consistent attendance. And then, you know, that you would you would potentially have that same number of people enrolled, and then you get a TA. Wow. Right. So the, it was a lot of You proving. really had to sell yeah. it then. So you know what I told Gil the first week? I remember I was going to go in. I said, you know what? I came up for, for both of my classes. I've come up with this list of the top 10 reasons you should take my class, and that's my opening lecture. Oh, okay. And he said, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And he said, you know what? But don't be, don't be worried if people are leaving. And I was terrified people were going to take off. My audience is going to leave, you know. <laughs> you know, and so my whole thing was, you know, keep them there, seated, yeah. so they're not going to leave. And it worked. Do you, um, do you think a model like that would work uh, elsewhere? Or I, mean, I still use the top 10 reasons to take my class, although I don't call it that anymore. No, I mean the students selecting, the students moving out of the courses that they don't like. Or I don't think that that works everywhere. The, I mean, I yeah. think that it works at a place where, in fact, at Yale, you know, the number one major for decades and decades and decades until I think very recently was history. Mm. I mean, when I was there, it was the number one major, most popular major. And so that says something about um, this, the rigor, um, uh, that rigor can, when it's high, that people will rise to the occasion. It says something about um, socialization of students. I mean, I do think that when you are teaching at the freshman level, mm -hmm. and we, we lack this um, tragically, here at the University of Florida, we're hopefully going to be changing that in the next couple of years. But we don't have um, a way to socialize students, and I think that's a political project on the part of the legislature and, and our governor here that has succeeded. We don't have a way to socialize students in their freshman year to value the humanities. And so when I arrived, 
you know, eight years ago, um, Rick Scott and the legislature gutted, utterly financially gutted um, their Tea Party kind of a movement. Right. Um, our um, financing, our budgets for um, the history department and other um, humanities um, departments as well as social sciences, they promoted STEM. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and effectively did so across the board so that um, most students here in public schools um, who are BR feeder institutions for UF, um, they're being told that they'll never get a job and that, if you know, they, they don't do that STEM. humanities is just like... Yeah. So we have, I mean, my, my figures are probably only slightly off, but about 80% of the kids who come here as freshmen are, are, STEM. are STEM students. Wow. And then most of them, more, about half of them, can't pass basic... Um, math and science classes in those majors that they propose that they're going to do. Right. And so now we're finally getting the attention of the politicians because after they've gutted <laughs> our programs, now we have to find a way to put these kids into our classes who are actually not prepared. They don't have right. necessarily the skills because they didn't acquire them in high school yeah. to read and write at a very high level. Yeah, that's a big problem. So, yeah, so one solution to that, and I think everywhere should be the solution, is that, you know, kids who are in their freshman year, when they're still, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, should have the opportunity to take um, rigorous, um, exciting humanities classes that answer, especially history classes, that answer big questions. Like, what is the origin of race? What is racism? Um, do you th- do what you, is sexism? Do you think yeah. that um, having more of a forum where students can like debate and discuss these kind of things would be helpful to that? Rather than, like, sometimes I feel like uh, my students are so isolated. Like, they're learning totally different. They might be taking their core humanities requirement, but they're learning something different. Or if they're reading the same assigned books, it's being taught in a totally different way. This is kind of like, and then there's nowhere to discuss it in a big university setting. Mm -hmm. Is that, like, how could we facilitate sort of like actual participation in this kind of thing rather than just passive, you know, take your humanities course and get that stamp and Mm -hmm. move on. No, I think that the institutions have to commit um, their faculty to speaking to one another and creating a set of potentially like, you know, freshman seminar, Mm first-year seminars um, that offer students the opportunity to explore in a historical way, for instance, or through literature, um, something that's very valuable to them. And I don't believe that this young generation of students would find, um, in, you know, race or gender or sexuality to not be valuable. They would find those things to be extremely valuable because they're having to figure out what does all this mean? You know, what is going on in our, in our lives here that, um, that is, it seems now, especially under Trump, to be a very intense dimension of our existence. I find most of my students are e- either totally frightened of talking about race or um, like just totally, they totally unplug. Um, like I teach on co- colonialism and empire and things like that. You can't teach that without talking about race, you know, obviously. But any time that the students will like know that's the answer on why a policy was put forth or something, but they're so hesitant to um, speak. Do you find that to be uh, case or do you are students ready to talk about it? Well, okay. So I have my own strategy for dealing with this. I do believe it exists, um, and that is that you know the the classroom is not a democracy. So I don't do debates before people have right. equal amounts of knowledge, um, oh. and I, they acquire equal amounts of knowledge over time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, in the course of that same class, you know, they, they by the ninth or tenth or twelfth week of the class, maybe they could engage in debate. Maybe, I often right? think, <laughs> yeah, maybe I often think that debates are the wrong way to go because they uh-huh. they you tend to de- devolve into yeah. black and white kinds of understandings of the world. Um, instead, I um, I think that the the knowledge is something that as they be- begin to acquire it, they begin to also acquire similar terminology mm-hmm. um, that's valuable, that use that seems to make sense. That oh okay, and there's an echo between um, there's an echo effect um, between you know how I'm speaking about something how the documents we're reading and the secondary sources we're reading and um, the way that they're thinking. When there is, you know, when when there is an echo effect, then they'll start 
kind of putting all this fear and concern aside. Um, and, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean that I can't be flippant sometimes, you know, and say, um, so, you know, what, uh, what's the common denominator between X, Y, and Z? And everybody will look at me blankly and I go, right. well... Yeah. They're all black. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then people burst out laughing. Right. right? Because, um, yeah. Needless to say, though, you know, I mean, it depends on the, the, you know, how many black students you have in a class. But often, you know, the kids who are the, have the biggest problem with this are the white kids. Yeah. You know, because they don't want to be wrong. Um, they don't know how to explain things. They're not accustomed to, in fact, um, more out of a sense of humility than out of a sense of arrogance. Right. They're not accustomed to claiming, you know, um, the history of Afro-Americans being, you know, all of Afro Latinidad and Afro African Americans, yeah. they're not they're not used to identifying with and claiming the position, for instance, of of Marcus Garvey and, and analyzing Marcus Garvey's writings um, from potentially what Marcus Garvey intended those writings to be about. Um, and so, when you ask them, so what do you think his intention here was? What's his purpose? What's his strategy? Yeah. You know that um, enables. Um, these kids to have to, in fact, identify with, engage, and 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 walk in somebody else's moccasins. You know, yeah. what I mean, and that that then opens things up. Um, it 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 makes them different. It makes them understand that knowledge is a, a source of of power. Um, and, 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 and allows them to talk to each other, you know, about, um, how in fact they may be at a deficit for how this applies to their lives because they've never in their lives had to consider, you know, um, how others perceive them uh, because white privilege is white privilege. As for the building up though, a vocabulary, like for example, white privilege, something like that. Um, one of the keys to getting these discussions going, right, you said, is building up a vocabulary or a common knowledge base so you know what you're talking about. But um, I've, well, is it true that people um, are getting definitions from different places or how do you build up a knowledge base and how do we know that we're building up the right knowledge base? Because I think a lot of the background knowledge that I got before I went into school and, you know, PhDs and PhD students are typically the people who are the best students, you know, so mm -hmm. I was always reading books and so I was developing my own knowledge base through the books that I was reading, and they just happened to be the assigned material and the classics. Now people are reading um, whatever, you know, tweets, what's on the internet, things mm -hmm. like that. So uh, it's how, how do you build that knowledge base, and how do we know that everyone's building a good knowledge base mm -hmm. to discuss mm -hmm. this? Well, okay, so um, you, in a particular class, you have to have a lot of discussion, but you also need to have lectures. And so this notion that we should just surrender the podium is foolish, um, precisely because students have very fragmented, young people have very fragmented um, sources for their own news, let alone, right. you know, um, understandings of something like the American dream. So I'll give you that as an example. I mean, when you're teaching, like I taught a class um, that is a is a comparative analysis of the sort of transnational communities of Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans. And it's the cultural history of these, of these communities. Um, so one of the things I take on pretty early in the class is what is the American dream? And it has a history. Um, it's, you know, it was a term developed in 1932 by a high school teacher. Um, that changes everything when you say that. <laughs> Holy cow. And then, you know, I explain uh, that it really doesn't gain traction in popular culture, part of become part, part of the discourse until um, after World War II hmm. and in the 1950s. And for whom was the American dream really coming to life at that point? And, and there, you know, you turn to history. Well, if the American dream is that, you know, we live in a meritocratic society and all of us can make it if we just work hard enough. I mean, that's effectively the image and the th idea that stands behind it. Um, if that's the truth, if that's what we understand it to be, then who were the people who came to believe in this at the end of World War II and, and the 1950s? Well, it turns out that they're all white folks right. who were the children of immigrants themselves in many cases. And why is that true? Why was it not Puerto Ricans? Why was it not African Americans? Because 
effectively being um, being successful in the United States meant that you could live a middle class lifestyle even if you were working class. And so who was doing that? The people who were members of labor unions. And labor unions by the 1940s and the 1950s were um, producing tremendous dividends for their members, except that those, those memberships did not include blacks and Puerto Ricans because they were banned. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> you know, they were barred from right. joining. So when, when, you know, the faces in the classroom when I start putting up these slides and the statistics and, you know, with the faces in the classroom, suddenly they go, oh, yeah, because segregation is not just about not having access to a lunch counter. Mm -hmm. It's about in the North, where unions were the most successful um, in major industries, you know, they're, they're white supremacist institutions that ban non-whites from joining. And the only way you did join as the immigrant, you know, the child of Polish folks or Irishmen or whatnot, is if you adopted the same values that were defined, you know, as the true American values by Teddy Roosevelt, et cetera, in, right. in the 19th century, the Anglo-Saxon race had expanded its boundaries, mm -hmm. but had done so on certain terms. And so joining those, um, you know, adopting those terms included excluding others because they didn't look like you, because they were racial inferiors, because they spoke a different language, because there's all these logics that were involved. So that, Len, you know, that it's a good example of how, you know, what I deal with and, and what I suggest we all do is we figure out what is the biggest elephant that could take over the room, huh. you know, and in a class that compares Latino immigrants, um, Caribbean immigrants, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, the, the biggest, always when you deal with immigration, the biggest one is, is the American dream. Um, and, you know, the Cuban American dream has also roots and explanations um, that have to do with um, the U.S. government effectively funding the success of Cubans after 1961. Um, and when you could show that, you know, the Cuban refugee program, $2.2 billion, yeah. um, you can show how um, Cuban businessmen in Miami got subsidies from the CIA. Now we know that. You know, you didn't have to make a profit if you were getting a subsidy from the CIA and yet you're African American or you're white American business owner who is on your same block. He, he couldn't compete with you because right. he had to make a profit. You know, these kinds of things, they totally radically change, you know, the nature of, of the discussion. Right. Um, and it sounds like that's a good approach to have a clear way of laying it out where you take, you know, I think that's great. You take the biggest elephant in the room and you define it and you just go for it. And that sounds a lot like your top 10. Maybe those yeah. get into your top 10. <laughs> but is that the way you approach uh, writing a book too? No. No. <laughs> because you've, you're, you've written a lot of stuff, you're, you know, a ton of books right. and you know so it's different you're not you're it, not going um, because you're writing books to a yeah. different audience obviously although you know you're you're right i mean it's different but it's not that different i mean i and in writing my books i anticipate especially on cuba you have to anticipate um, every possible argument that could be arrayed against yours and when you do that um, you also begin to see um, that perhaps you're wrong. You know, you, you begin to question your own evidence. Um, you've got a constant check on what is your instinct to plow through um, and say, you know, this is what happened. Um, so, yeah, so you, you know, my one of my um, best advisors was um, Steve Stern um, as a graduate student. And um, he said, you know, that one of the things that you have to do when you're writing is you have to... Um, you know, co-opt every possible naysayer, um, and you do that, you refute through co-optation. And that doesn't mean that you, um, you know, you do this in a kind of an artificial way. That means that if, uh, if there are, you know, a whole lot of arguments and you're trying to take on a whole historiographic, um, you know, position mm -hmm. that has been re repeated and repeated, if you're going to do that, you really need to know what the component parts of that historiographic position are. Why, what are the sources they're drawing from? So you need to know not only your stuff really well, but you need to know their stuff really, which, really well. Which is a lot like what you were saying for the teaching. Like yeah. before, <laughs> before we throw these it's human beings into like right. debate intense battle they should know what the other person knows and what the other person thinks but that seems kind of contrary to how people kind of have discussions or yeah. arguments and how we see arguments in in mass media and even op-eds in the news it's not 
there are sometimes straw men that are constructed, you know, and that's as much of the other argument as that you're going to get. And oh, it's sure. not even a real representation. So I think that's um, really valuable and really important. And, and hopefully um, historians can keep teaching that kind of thing. Um, can I say one more thing about that? Yeah, please. You reminded me, it's a very good example. Yeah. Um, journalists are very lazy. Um, and <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm always getting, I, I always give my friend a hard time because he's a journalist, but journalists can be very lazy. And when I say this, um, I'll give you an example that CBS um, recently had a, okay. a panel of women who were Democrats and a panel of women who were Republicans and three and three. Perfect. And um, so the reporter is also a woman and she asked, you know, so um, are you feminists? And of course, all three Republican women said no. And when she pursued that, um, one of them said, well, I'm not a feminist because I don't need to ask for rights I already have and left it at that. Um, far worse, I thought, was um, uh, the next person's um, comment, which is that you know, that people make up stories about there being a wage differential. And, and this was in part prompted by the journalist saying, well, you know, what do you think about the fact that, you know, we don't, women get paid less than men even for doing the same jobs. And so this Republican woman's position was that, um, in fact, you know, there is, there, it's a myth um, that there is um, really no pay differential and that you, you um, that really the reason that there is one or appears to be one is that women go into um, more traditional um, jobs that get paid less effectively. Uh -huh. So she's making the argument that we tend to choose just right. to become teachers, you uh -huh. know, rather than principals of schools. Or, right? Yeah, right. Or, <laughs> we just choose that, right, you know. Yeah. And so the journalist is dead silent in response to this. And I thought that's absurd, you know, that, you know, right. you, first of all, you have to follow that up. But what are the factors that push women to only have those professions at their disposal? And, and choice um, about, you know, whether you could be a principal or a teacher is really just, it's, it's a stupid, absurd kind of thing. You don't just choose, you know? What choices are arrayed to you and made possible for you are made by whom? A bunch of women? No, by a vast majority of men, you know? Right, well. <laughs> men are the ones who control, um, and men simply because of, they, because of their numbers, not just because of their attitudes, right. but, you know, the kinds of power that men have in society but, but in when, virtually any profession. When you ask those kind of questions, it doesn't fit into a five-minute segment for TV. Um, <laughs> right, which is what, then you wonder what is her purpose there and having right. this, is it sensationalism? Is it to show that both sides, you know, are quote, right? You know, I mean, th that, th there, it can't be about both sides being right. It has to be about beyond that. You have to take that yeah. further. You know, if women populate um, certain traditional quote unquote professions, um, you know, that may be true in certain professions, but you know, we have equal numbers of women and men becoming doctors these days. Um, so one has to wonder, you know, how much more do women doctors get paid than men? Both sides can't be right. Um, and when it comes to something that can be factually um, proven or disproven, you know, and, and so this, I think that, um, that we, this kind of relativism to which journalists ascribe in order to show that somehow they are being objective. Right. Um, is it's it's really false. It's it's a comfort. Um, it's it's a comfortable uh, and, and, position. But they're doing that uh, both to meet. They've got to put. They don't have as much time as say a historian does, right? They have to put it out, especially now. Um, but I've. But this was not a live broadcast. You know right, it's taped. You got some time to edit. Yeah, <laughs> but I've also heard that those shows pick people very, very carefully. <laughs> I used to look at these shows and think, oh, I want to be the historian expert for this country or whatever, um, because there used to be historians and experts, but that it seems now that it's just a lot of like... Right, and it's a, a, I think it's um, pandering, frankly, to the anti-intellectual impulse um, and the anti-academic impulse of Trump's um, version of populism, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an assumption because, again, you know, journalism um, is often profit-driven, especially televised journalism. Um, and when it's profit-driven, then it's not just about how much time you have. It's the assumption that your public, um, you know, wants to feel comfortable. And I think... Um, CBS is a great competitor, just like NBC or ABC or CNN's great competitor is Fox News. Yeah. Um, and so Fox is all about pandering to the lowest possible denominator when it comes to, um, you know, facts 
um, analysis of something that can be proven or disproven based on just a little bit of statistical, you know, gathering. Um, these, I think it's frightening, the prospect that um, we would have our mainstream news media um, begin to assume similar um, kinds of attitudes as the one that this particular show um, yeah. assumes, or that that kind of format assumes. And it seems that's that's much more common these days, um, at least than it was like a little bit ago. All right. Well, unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, and I'm, I'm sure we could talk for hours and hours and hours, but you have so much... I mean, you're working all day and talking all the time. Um, so we're almost to an hour. And I didn't tell you this before, so now I'm going to put <laughs> you on the spot. But typically we end the show with just one recommendation. It could be anything from, um, I know we started talking about Cuba, which is one thing that we could have kept talking about, but it got so interesting about education. Um, that's why an hour is a shame. Like we could go on. Um, but it can be from Cuba. It could be about education. It could be about anything. So sometimes people suggest movies that they like. It doesn't matter. Oh, I have a recommendation right after Perfect. that. Um, well, you know, I think that probably very appropriate um, uh, would be David Blight's um, Race and Reunion. It's a book about um, the post-Civil War era. And there's a chapter in there, which is the one that I, I find the most riveting, um, that is about congressional hearings um, uh, dealing with the kind of rise of the KKK um, amidst Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction. And you have, in fact, a lot of, you know, heroic white folks who had witnessed um, horrors um, after the Civil War and who are trying to influence um, U.S. Congress into um, legislating what wouldn't happen for another, almost another hundred years. Hmm. Um, and, and having the United States live up to its promise, and, and a promise for which, you know, um, more people had died in the Civil War than for, you know, any, uh, than any other war, right? That's the yeah. war in which most, more Americans died. Um, so I would say that. I also think that some of us should go back to these old classics. Can you, get, um, you can give us some. There's no, there's uh, no uh, <laughs> limit to that. We, we can link to whatever you say. Yes, like, like uh, it, uh, it sounds like a lot of your argumentation and stuff is informed by reading classics broadly. And, yeah. And, well, and, and Eric, I mean Eric, um, Eric Foner's books are, are, you know, I think of them as um, not so classic because you know he, like David Blight, um, are quote pretty young unquote. <laughs> um, you know, it's the dead guys that yeah. I think of as as having written classics. But um, you know, the the great books of um, that of U.S. history yeah. um, that have very much influenced me include, um, you know, The Black Image and the White Mind. Um, they're great novels to be read, too. Um, Just that well great, written, too, huh? Yeah, that are substitutes. I mean, Juno the Yes is um, um, The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde mm -hmm. is one of the best ways to understand Dominican, Dominican. history. Yeah. Um, the burdens of Dominican masculinity and um, how masculinity can be extremely oppressive. Um, you know, Waiting for Snow in Havana is a spectacular novel. Achi Ovejas, um, Memory mm -hmm. Mambo. Um, so there are many ways to Great. approach yeah. that question. No, I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, you have enough reading for the next month. That's great. We'll put links to that all online. For this week, my recommendation is uh, the London School of Economics has a great podcast site that they update regularly. They have a lecture series that goes. And so if, if you're just, you know, behind on knowledge in an area, say you don't know a lot about China, they have, you know, a China expert come to the LSE and they put their podcasts up right away. It's always relevant. It's always recent. And there's some really good lecture series that and it's updated about every week. Um, so I always check that out. So great. We have uh, ex another excellent hour of history. Dr. Lillian Guetta, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you. Uh, thanks, as always, for listening to Hour of History, where it's our world, any place, anytime. time.